Hello and good afternoon to OOP 244 ZAA, if I'm correct. ZAA, right? It is ZAA. All right. So, my name is Fardad. Uh, I'll be taking care of your OOP 244 this semester. Um, uh, uh, the class that I do, um, the very first thing that I mention like, to my students in my class that I try to make the class as friendly as possible. Um, I do not like the, the prof-student relationship. I'd rather have a kind of a friendly relationship with my students and uh, uh, um, like that, the atmosphere of learning is, is, uh, is easier, okay? Um, but there is a problem with that. So friendship is like any other relationship. It's like, um, best friends forever. If one of them cheats, the other one gets really pissed off. That's what happens. So although we have this relationship thingy between us, and I'll try to help you as much as I can to get through this semester and hopefully pass it with flying colors, but please don't cheat, okay? Uh, that I cannot, it, it doesn't matter what is our relationship, it doesn't matter how friendly we are, um, you cheat, directly goes and um, I guarantee you cheating in this class, you're going to fail, okay? It doesn't matter what you cheat in. If you cheat in a project, you poof, suddenly 30% goes down, and because project has to be passed, for the subject to pass, you fail. If, we fail, if you're cheating one of the tests, the same thing, okay? Sorry that I started with this thing. I just want to put it in open so everybody knows. Uh, I am Farad. Um, I've been doing this for... Lost track. 20 something years, 25, 6 years, I don't know, something like that. 24 years, I don't know. Since 1988 at Seneca College, okay? Um, uh, my mother tongue is C. Uh, I love this language, it's a beautiful language. It, it, uh, it um, helps you get into any language that you want. Any cool language that came out of that is actually based on the syntax of C++, like Java, like JavaScript, like C Sharp. These are all languages that came after C++ and just took the syntax. But anyways, um, uh, we'll go through all those things, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, you will see how everything works. It's a, it's a fun class. Um, of course, it's relative, right? It's not fun like some liberal study that you're talking about movies, right? It's C++, so it's pretty dry. I try to act like a clown, I try to make you laugh, I will try to, whatever, to, to kind of keep it in a way so we can all understand what we're doing, but um, my apologies, it sometimes gets boring. Uh, you have to, I always tell to my nine-year-old that uh, in order to learn, you have to get bored, okay? Always. And you never need to ask for permission. If you want to get out, just go out. If you want to come in, just come in. Okay? All right. And that was a good question. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So um, I do my classes live, which means when I teach something, I code. Okay? I write the code for you, and I teach you via co coding. So I'm going to code. You're going to see me coding. You're going to see me making mistakes. You're going to see me trying to fix those mistakes. And therefore, you're going to learn how you can fix your own mistakes when you're dealing, okay? Uh, you are in second semester, so you're kind of familiar, familiar with programming. You have done some stuff uh, through it, which is very fine. Uh, but the era of programming alone is over. Those times that one person sat in his basement and did a computer and wrote a program and made millions, it's gone, okay? Uh, programming can only be done through collaboration. You have to be able to work with each other, work with uh, your partners to be able to do uh, your work. That's why um, in your assignments, in your workshops, and in your uh, project, cheating is uh, actually permitted in my class. You can cheat. Of course, it's not called cheating anymore if you cite it. Okay, like any scientist, like any person who's in pursuit of knowledge, if any piece of your code or anything doesn't work, you can simply borrow that part from your friend. But in your 
source code, you're going to mention that this part of my code is borrowed from John. I'm going to say thank you to John, and if the program is 100%, you're going to lose 5% of it and you get 95 because you didn't do 5% of it. Okay? So that's what happens. If you need some part and you're like in stress and you want to submit your work and to do it is tomorrow, I can't figure this part out, you ask a friend, the friend, or you ask me, or whatever, you go on the internet, you find a solution, you cite it. Okay? That's what you do. In everywhere in the world, this happens. Okay? That's actually how open source is. Okay? So again, you can do that. Um, and that's that. Uh, all help and everything that I do in class is done online. Uh, why is that? Because when it's online, I have full control on your computer. You're sitting at your screen. I'm sitting at my screen. We are working on Microsoft Teams. I do not read any email. Your communication with me only happens through Microsoft Teams. Install it, log into it. Through here, you can find out when I'm available. So you can actually book an appointment. So you can click on calendar over here. And as soon as you invite me, you're going to see all the times that I'm available per day. So you can see, OK, far that is free between 4 to 5. I can book an appointment here. OK? Uh, if you click on calendar, you'll see exactly how it is. It's not that, like rocket science. You can easily do it. My phone number is already mentioned in my uh, faculty thingy. You're going to see this is the phone number that you're going to call. You'll see all these things. I'm going to go through them one by one. But all the help that we're going to do is going to happen through Microsoft Teams. You're already a member of this team. I already added you to this team. So if you open Microsoft Teams, you're going to see, oh, there is a OOP244 NAA and ZAA office and help over there, which you can actually even when you have problem with pieces of your code, you can actually put that segment of your code, not the whole program, don't do that, okay? But if a piece of your code doesn't work, you simply copy and paste it over here and let all the students help you. There's no problem with that. It's a beautiful thing to do, okay? That's collaboration. Anyways, you can send private messages on team to me, Teams to me, um, and I'll reply to them as soon as possible. I don't guarantee it's going to be exactly the same minutes and, and, and thing, but usually between one or two days, I'm going to reply to it, or sometimes immediately, okay? I have an official office hour that you can, that I will be sitting at my computer waiting for people to call me on Teams. Those are the times that is guaranteed I'm, I'm, I am on my computer. The office hours are on, uh, I'll, I'll show you where to go for all those things. Let me actually show it to you. So if uh, you uh, go to the OOP244 uh, uh, um, GitHub organization, um, how many of you, uh, you've already, from IPC, you zip download the thingy with PDF stuff, right? We don't do that anymore. Well, you're going to learn actually work with Git, OK? My class, you have to. That's workshop zero, OK? I call it workshop zero. You start today. I put like 11, I think, videos online to set up your computers. So you can set up your computer to actually be able to work on Git, which means you're going to create your own uh, little space, private space on Git and on GitHub, and you do all your work in there. And right from the beginning of the semester, you're going to add me as a collaborator. So I can see your code, and any time you need any help, I simply pull the code. Pull in Git terms means download. You pull the code. I pull the code. I'll it right in front of you. I fix the code. I push the code. That means upload. Okay? And then you pull the code. It only downloads or pulls the changes. And then you simply tell to Git, show me the differences. And it shows what your code was, what changes I made to make it work. All you need to do is to reflect on these changes and done. Okay? So this is how, how I help students. And you, if you want to go somewhere, if you are here just to get your PR, that's a different story. But if you want to actually work in computer science, you need to learn how to work with Git. There is no company or anything out there that doesn't work with some kind of code uh, revision which is uh, code versioning, which is essentially Git, okay? Subversion, 
Git and other things, but Git is the master of everything. Okay? And we're going to learn, you don't need to be masters. I don't know Git. I just know the things that I, that I need to know. The, because Git is open source, the book for it is open source. They are all in there. You can, uh, you can actually see it in the, in the announcement that I sent. You can click over there. You read chapter 1, 2. You already know more than me. And chapter 1, 2 is totally 60 pages. Don't think that it's like I'm asking you to read 300 pages of, of things. It's a very small little thing. But I'm telling you, I'm going to show you how uh, uh, little things work. So anyways, uh, in here in the uh, Seneca College, of, uh, in the uh, organization of Git, let me see if, I, if the organization is actually, I'm going to go to your, uh, uh, oops, probably it's going to ask for the, will it? Shoot. And we are in. So if we go to courses, OP244ZAA, that's you. And we go to the announcements over here. Lectures and problems, as yet, may be recorded. So if you click over here, it shows where they are. I'm just going to see if I have the, the link for it over here. If I don't, I'm just going to add it. Yeah. But anyways, all you need to do is to just go to Google and type OOP244 GitHub. Okay? And the very first thing that's going to come up is that one. So OOP244 GitHub, it's going to come up. I add the link to it too. So you go in here in the organization, and in the organization, what you are going to see over here is OOP244 NAA and ZAA notes. Those are the two sections of OOP244 that I teach. And in here, you will see anything that I do in class. Okay, so any code I write, anything I do in, cl in class goes right in here. Okay, you, I'm going to demonstrate today, so you'll see. Okay, so the very first thing that you're going to see over here is Workshop Zero that you're going to start today, and it's due on Monday. So you click on the playlist, and you go to this YouTube thingy, and it has one, two, three, Visual Studio 2022. If you have it, forget it. Uh, Git installation, putty installation, uh, creating GitHub account, setting up GitHub profile, Tortoise Git installation, SSH key, how to create all those things for those who have Mac computers. Uh, uh, please, uh, v uh, VMware Fusion, okay? Uh, I have the link over there. Download VMware, v VMware Fusion. Uh, that's a virtual machine which essentially puts a computer inside the belly of your computer. Okay, then you can install Windows 10 on that virtual machine and s uh, tell what you want to use out of it. Okay, and uh, you need to learn how to work with Visual Studio. All those pe people who have Mac computers, this is a subject that is based on Visual Studio because it's uh, one of the best development environments in the world and you need to know it to be somebody. Obviously, afterwards, you're going to go to Java courses and stuff. You're going to learn stuff, other type of IDEs. But for this, you need to know it. If you want to do game programming, you need to know this. If you want to do parallel programming, you need to know it. If you want to do GPU programming, you need to. All these things, you need to know Visual Studio. But why now? Because what we are doing is kindergarten stuff. What we are doing are all child stuff. So. Doing child stuff with Visual Studio is much easier than to go to sixth semester. Suddenly, they tell you, okay, this is a GPU with 4,000 CPUs. Now, write a parallel program that runs it and create a solution in Visual Studio to do it. Then you're going to say, what? Which one I'm going to learn? When you are used to this development environment, then when you go to more complicated subjects, you don't have to deal with the, uh, uh, the platform. You just deal with the subject. So, please. Those who have Mac, do that. Follow these stuff, install them all, uh, go through the installation, and the last thing that it's going to do is to ask you to create a, a private repository on GitHub. GitHub used to be uh, uh, only public, so you could only have public repositories, but after Microsoft bought it, it allowed for you to have private repositories too, and that's heavenly for us. Before that even, you could have applied for student 
uh, uh, development package of GitHub, and it would give you many different softwares. You can still do that. Go we'll get the development uh, uh, package for GitHub. It gives you license for many softwares out there that you have to pay money for. And you just log in with your Seneca. Uh, you put your Seneca email ID and password, knows that you're a student, and then uh, you can take advantage of many things. But anyways, you create a private repository on GitHub. Creating a private repository is like creating a directory on a in a cloud for yourself. It's not like iCloud or what is Apple's thingy? You have an Apple, right? What is an Apple shared thingy? What do they call it? iCloud? Larry, iCloud. It's not like iCloud or uh, uh, OneDrive on Microsoft and things like that. GitHub is a shared space with an extremely intelligent supervisor always watching. Any changes you make to your code will be remembered. Anyone who does a change to your code can be identified who did what to pieces of your code. So if I do something to your code, you can actually go say, hey, which one was fired out so I can see what he did. You can undo stuff and go back to three hours and 45 minutes before and see what you have done over there if you, what you have done is bad and you want to go back. Nothing will be lost. Anything that you will do will be tracked. Not only tracked, but also Git is a distributed application, which means the Git program that GitHub is running on their ginormous servers, you can run, run, put the same program in your computer. Actually, it comes with Mac, OK? So you can install Git on your computer. So what you do, you exactly clone what you have on GitHub on your local computers. What happens then is that you have two identical entities. One is on GitHub, one is on your computer. You don't even need to be connected to internet. You do your work on your local computer. You keep committing. Commit means save, an intelligent type of save. You keep committing to your uh, local repository. Whenever you are connected to internet, you simply say, sync it. Push everything to master repository. Poof, or they call it upstream. See the fish go upstream? It's the same thing. So you can actually send stuff upstream to GitHub. So it syncs the two things, and you tell me, and I can pull. And like that, we can all work together and learn stuff much easier. So that's the first thing you're going to do, all right? And go through this workshop zero, and everything's going to be done over there. And uh, so please, and next day that you're coming in, you have a lab, right? Bring your computers. Do your stuff. If you have a problem, I can help you. OK? And after that, call me at home on MS Team. We go together. I'll help you. If anything is wrong and you cannot set stuff up, I'll help you. OK? There's no problem with that. All right. One more thing that I'm going to uh, ask if anybody have any questions. So I'm going to go through the things that we have in here so, so we, we cover everything. So you know that it's. Uh, let me make it a little bigger. Okay, you know that it's got to be two sessions, uh, lab, lecture and the lab. But lab, lab, lab is not uh, only lab. So what happens with lab is that you should start doing your workshops at home, and then you come to lab with problems. That's what you do, okay? You start at home, you come to lab with problems, you solve your problems, and then you continue. You cannot start in lab, OK? So lab is essentially a problem-solving session, not a workshop that we start from zero, and you start doing everything, and you finish your lab. Each lab has two parts. Workshop has two parts. One is lab that is heavily guided. Essentially, you follow the instructions, and you do the lab. Part two uses the same concept, but it's open-ended. We just tell you, we want this, and you have to do it by, on your own. OK? So you learn in part one, you do in part two. That goes up to halfway through the semester. After midterm, there is only part one. There is no part two. There is no DIY. There is no do-it-yourself. Why? Because that's when project kicks in. 
and project starts from the study break to the end of the thing and you're going to write a fully functional application from zero on your own and you use all the concepts that we have and because you are writing that application that is fully functional and you're writing it you i'll figure out something and i'll come up with some kind of real life sub version of an application so it's a sub subset of an application that you can do uh, and by the end of that one, you'll learn exactly how it's done. Uh, workshops are uh, submitted using the submitter program. You've already used submitter program, right? My apologies. I did that. I wrote that program because we needed to check to see, make sure all the files and stuff that the students are doing are actually compiling properly. And it was impossible to do so many. Okay, so I had to kind of automate it. So that's that. Okay, the source of submitter is open on GitHub. You can go actually take a look at it, see how it works if you want. Okay, so uh, if you go to my, uh, if you search GitHub for that, submitter is there. You can actually see how it works. This whole source code is in there, and it is done with the knowledge of OP244. Okay, so it's not a very complicated program. Um, For the project, you have four milestones initially and a fifth milestone. The four milestones takes you from the, you're not supposed to design anything. This is not the time for you to design. You need to learn to code. Design comes in the systems courses. Don't forget that, okay? You do micro designings. You do little things, designing the class, doing a little bit over there, design that function, you do stuff, but the whole picture, I'll take care of it. And I'll tell you, milestone one, you have to do this. And you have to trust me on that. You don't need to know the big picture when milestone one is done. I know what the big picture was, and I put the requirements in milestone one. You do the milestone one, you test it, it passes, you go to the next one, passes. So the first four milestones, they have a due date, but the due date is pretty soft. So we put a due date, but if you even submit one week late, you get your full mark for it. So milestone one, two, three, and four are just writing the engine of what you're going to do in milestone five. In milestone five, you write the application. Obviously, not everybody uh, will be able to finish it. It's a difficult thing, right? And we don't expect to. That's why milestone five is submitted through six steps. And each step has 10%. So you do four milestones, that 10, that's 40%. You submit one steps of milestone five, that's 50%. Then the second, 70, 30, 40, uh, 30, uh, 80, 90, and 100, and you, you finish your thing. If a couple of features don't work and you didn't implement it, there's no problem. You get 80%, okay? But that's that. So that's workshop and, and the project. And what else? Recordings and submissions. As you see, I record. I've, I've recorded all my lectures since, I, have, I don't remember, since YouTube came out. Okay? So if you Google for that on, on, on YouTube, you're going to see stuff from, I don't know, a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. Um, uh, and, I'm, and I've continued doing that. Okay? So um, it is there. But there is no guarantee that it's going to be there. The battery goes bad. The thing fails. Something that you don't, you can't trust that I'm going to have a recording for every single session. That these recordings are for review purposes only. You cannot skip the class and say I'm going to watch the recording later because last night I drank too many beers. Okay, can't do that. You have to come to class and the, the atmosphere of class and the fact that you look at me acting like a clone and. I don't know, talking to your friends when I say be quiet and things like that. All these things help you to actually learn, okay? And again, you have to get bored. It is, this is really important. That's why I program and I teach. So when I'm programming, you say, oh my God, he's typing so slow. And you come on, write the next for loop. And, and, and that feeling of come on, that is making your brain to think what logic I'm writing and makes it get committed into your permanent memory, okay? If I just show you a slide and pass, you won't learn anything, okay? So keep that in mind.
faculty information, everything's up there. You can see workshops I just mentioned. Uh, you know that submitter program has some options, right? You can add skip spaces. You can add skip lines. You can add, you can add uh, feedback. So when I post it, sometimes we post the web, uh, the post the, the workshop, but it's not open for submission, and you want to test it. You simply write the submit program, and at the end you write dash feedback. Like that, it runs through and does everything, but it doesn't send it to me. Okay, that's dash feedback. Or you say skip spaces. So you did it, the output is perfect, but the spaces don't match. You don't have time to fix it. You say skip spaces. So it still submits it with an incorrect output that is not properly formatted. You have extra lines that you want to fix. Okay, keep that in mind. You have one midterm test, one final test, each one. For now, if the school doesn't mandate, it's going to be in the lab on the computer. But it's as if you are doing it on paper, which means you have to bring a reference sheet. You open one page on your computer, and you do it on Blackboard as one thing. There is no text editor or anything. You cannot open Visual Studio or do it. You have to just, as if you are writing it on paper, instead you just type it on a screen. Okay? It doesn't have to be. Remember, my tests, you don't have to write the perfect code. As long as you demonstrate that you kind of know what's going on, you get the full mark. What I put under microscope is your workshops and your final project, something that you have four months to do. In an hour and a half, I don't expect you to write a beautiful, spotless program. It's impossible. So don't forget if you miss a semicolon. Don't forget if you misspell. Don't care if you misspelled something, those things won't cost you marks, okay? In test, I need you to demonstrate to me how you've done it, okay? All right. Yeah, if, if there's emergency, you have to always call me and, and uh, leave a message to, to, so we, when I say emergency, oh yes. Pardon me? No, everybody passes the test. I give two, I give hundred percent to everyone. I'm joking. <laughs> Criteria. Okay, fifty percent. Fifty percent for the test. Okay, fifty percent is overall of the of the subject. So you have to get that, and you have to get fifty percent in weighted average of tests, which means uh, one part midterm, two parts final. That should be 50% too. And you should successfully submit your project. It means four milestones and at least one of the features. You may get zero in it, but you have to submit it. So not submitting the project. That's why I'm saying if you cheat into the project, you fail the subject because you copy one function and you don't mention it. And I see it's a, co it's a copy to someone else's you get zero in the entire thing. And therefore, you didn't give me, uh, you didn't submit your project successfully, therefore you failed the subject. Although it was only one function of the whole project. So careful with that. Okay? Cite whenever you get the code from, code from somewhere else. The uh, format of citing and how you're supposed to do all the citings and stuff are all on the, on the, uh, description of the workshop. So you, you see exactly how you have to cite and what you have to write. And if all the code is yours, then you have to write over there. I have done all the code by myself, and I did not get help from anyone or any sources. So that's that. So, and all the things that you just mentioned, they are all here, my friend. So to, if you forget what you need to pass the subject, you go to course information, and up here you have addendum. If you open up the addendum, over here it explains exactly how many percentages for what, how much weight for what something, how do you pass the subject, everything is right over here, and what, what is happening, and what is the, the weekly schedule. So everything is in there, you have all the information. Apart from that, you have weekly schedule. 
So if you click on weekly schedule, you will see first my schedule over here. So these are the two office hours that I mentioned. And if you click on this office hour, it brings you to Microsoft Teams. Okay? So that it brings you to the office. So you know where it is. And respect the dot. You see this? <laughs> okay? If it's do not disturb or red, please don't send me messages. Keep sending messages. Send messages, but don't call me. Message you can send me anyway. Okay? But don't call me, okay? Please, when I'm halfway through the thing and it starts ringing, don't do that, please, okay? Uh, but if I am available, available, that is green, or it's yellow, which means I'm away, you can call me. Maybe I'm downstairs and, and, and I hear my computer ringing and I run up and pick it up and I'll call you, or I, I'll see that I have a missed call and I'm going to call you back, okay? And if you want me to call you back on your cell, for any reason, then you have to leave the number in a private message, not on the team thingy that showing the, to the whole uh, 80 students in OP244, okay? So if you want me to call you back on yourself for any emergency reason, if you want me to call you back, please, okay, remember, uh, send it in a private message. Uh, any questions? Suggestions? Objections? Seriously? See, we have one person over here that talks. Go ahead. <laughs> What's your name, by the way? Naron. Naron? Okay. Uh, Naron, give me two seconds before I ask, before you, you tell. I have to apologize for murdering your names. Okay? I am so sorry that I do that. Okay? I call my own name incorrectly when I'm speaking in English. I say Fardat. It, my name is not Fardat. My name is Fardot. Okay, so it's so I apologize. I will not remember your names, and I keep asking Naron 55,000 55, times, but I remember faces. Okay, uh, which had which was problem in, during COVID, but now now I see everyone. Okay, so please, I apologize if I if I say your name incorrectly. And especially for those people who have aliases, in your Outlook you have one name, in Seneca you have another name, and then on the chat you have, so, so I apologize. Naren, go ahead. Uh, sir, I uh, quizzes will be done weekly, so um, I'll try to do it. Uh, there are two possibilities. Either we do it simultaneously during your lab, 10, 15 minutes, uh, or I open it for 24 hours, one day a week. I'd rather do it in the lab, because no matter how good and how uh, nice you are, the rating of cheating goes higher like that, okay? So, and it's bad for you, because I get you, and then you'll be in trouble, okay? Yes. Yeah, so the quiz happens on what we learned before, and a tiny little bit from what, what's, what's about to come. But the, the tiny little bit is only concept. So I'm not going to ask you before I teach, I don't know, overload the operator that does this and that. I know it's, I'm talking a foreign language now, but you understand what I'm saying in, in a couple of weeks. So I'm not going to do that. I'm going to ask you about concepts. Okay, things that you, if you read once, you're going to get an idea of what it is. If there is any question, about, but it's likely that's going to be, it's going to be that way. Yes, sir. Pardon me? Workshops. Uh, workshops, I'll try to release it on Friday, but each class will have its own time and due date. And you will see. Another option that Submitter has, I don't know if any of you used, is dash do. So if you put the submitter command and say dash do, it tells you exactly when is it due and all the stuff. Okay? Asking for extension. Okay? Asking for extension is an exceptional thing. If you need extension for a legit reason, you let me know. I will this semester, last semester, it was submit or zero. This semester, I'll give you two or three days to be late and I'll deduct approximately, say, 30 or 20% per day, approximately. I have to 
find out what it is and tell to all the profs to do that. But that's what's going to happen. So if for some unseen circumstance you can't do a workshop, you let me know. I'll give you extension. Okay? Or we can talk about it so you can submit that one during the study break. Because getting an extension for a workshop will do you no good. When you are doing this workshop, the other workshop is getting late. Okay? So stuff like this, if something exceptional happens and you can't do a workshop, and most of the workshop, six, uh, four, uh, 12 submittables of work deliverables of workshop are due before the study break and only four after. Okay? So uh, if you miss one or two, I'll give you extension to do it during the study break and submit it to me. Okay? So it's better do it that way. And if you ask for six extensions six, on six different things, then uh, something is wrong. Okay? Please don't do that. All right? Any other question, Nara? Because everybody has to sign. <laughs> yes? Oh, yes. Big time. Yes. That's why you make your repository public, you're shooting yourself in the foot. Because somebody's going to copy and you don't even know who it was. And you're going to be penal. And they're not going to even tell you who it was. You just know that your code is similar to someone else's. And then you. So it's, it's extremely important. No? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And it's all mentioned over this. So if, you, if somebody says, can I have your code? You will say yes. In the reflection part of the workshop, you're going to write, by the way, this part of code, Jack asked for it, and I gave it to that, that person. Like that, you're on the clear. If that person doesn't cite, that's cheating. You are not. OK? So, if you are, so either giving your code to someone or getting it from someone, you have to mention it. OK? And I may not even reply to that. So when, you, when you're saying, I gave my code to Jack, and I always say Jack. Who, is anybody named Jack over here? Do we have a Jack? No? Good. So, so if you give your code to Jack, all right, and uh, you mention that that's, that's the case, and Jack doesn't tell me, and I find a match, then I'll bring your source code up, and I'll see you said, I gave my code to Jack. And I'm going to say, that's fine. I'm not going to even let you know that anything wrong happened. And Jack only gets the thingy that it's, he's supposed to. Um, let's make it J, too. <laughs> anyway, so are we OK? OK. Any questions? You're good? Wow. All right. The subject material, unlike IPC 144, the subject material, unlike IPC 144, is not in a place that you can access freely. This semester, hopefully, that's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to send it where IPC codes were. If you actually want to access the, the, the uh, material that we have, so if you actually go to, no, that's not the one. If you actually click over here, probably it's not going to let you in. Oh, I am in Seneca, so it will. But if you are at home, you have to connect to that global VPN, Spiegelin Vingi, uh, whatever it is. You know which one I'm talking about, right? This uh, global protect thingy, OK? So you have to connect to that to be able to see it. Because of that fact, and some people may don't, ha don't have their ID and stuff, I have put the downloadable version of all the stuff that we have on Git. So if you actually look at Git, it says downloadable OP244 notes. And these are for all the weeks. So week 1 to week 13, all the stuff over there. So if you go over here, uh, you will see it says that one. You get the zip. You download it. You unzip it. It creates an HTML and its uh, pictures or whatever is needed. You click on that, and you can just access it, OK? I'm going to move all these things to that uh, open document thingy that we have exactly like IPC 144. All right? Uh, Anything else? Any questions? One. Any question? Two. Sold. OK, so let the games begin. It's, oh, when does the class end? 
Do 30? 20? Uh, so let's, let's have five minutes break and then we'll continue after that. I'm going to pause it. Always when I, when I go to break, people are come and ask questions instead of asking it in class, which is very fine. All right. Um, the office hours that I put, that's not the only time that I'm available. If you see I'm available at 12 o'clock at night, I don't care. We'll talk. Okay? If I'm available at 9 o'clock in the morning, we'll talk. Those two hours are the only hours that is guaranteed that I'm going to be at my computer waiting for people to call for help. In fact, if I cannot be at my computer like a regular cancellation, as I mentioned, and I cancel a class, I will cancel my office hours so you know I'm not there. Okay? So those two hours that I have for office hours, that's how it works out. Okay? So, uh, but any other time that you see I'm available, I'm yours. There's no problem. You can book an appointment. I either accept, decline, or request for a change. So when you submit a, an appointment on Microsoft Teams, you go to, to uh, it's called scheduling assistant. That's the top. You click on it, you'll see. You say who you want to have a meeting with. You're going to put for that. My name comes up. Then it shows all the availability. You suggest something and you request for, a, for an appointment. I'll take a look at it. And I'm going to say, oh, I, can, I, can, I cannot do that. Then I'm going to say, suggest, like, for example, an hour later. And I submit. And then we come up with the proper time, and then we talk. OK? And <clears throat> please don't book for three hours. OK, half an hour, please. OK, half an hour meetings. Not less than half an hour, because it's impossible. 15 minutes, unless you want to say, how are you? And I'm going to say, I'm good. How are you? And we hang up. OK? But if you really need help, we need half an hour to go through things. When you are asking for help, these are the things you need to have so I can actually help you. Number one, the path of your repository. So you go on the URL on GitHub. You, in the team meeting that we have, you send me the path of your repository. Number two, what exactly the problem is. My code doesn't work, does not apply. It doesn't work that way. You have to tell me my code doesn't work, and when it's executes at this moment, this happens, this message comes up, that yada, yada, yada. Then you mention, I have done such and such and such to fix it, and it didn't work. Okay, so these three information I need. You can't just, oh, it didn't work, let me run to far that. Or, or run to my friends, don't do that. Think a little. If you do not try to problem solve your code, you won't learn. The whole idea of giving you workshops and projects is for you to make a mistake and fix the mistake, hence learn. Okay? Please keep that in mind. All those things are mentioned. And in detail, read all those things. All the stuff that I have in the announcement and the things, read it carefully. Because later on, I'm going to catch you. I'm going to answer your question in two seconds. I had good students contacting me three days because they are superbly intelligent. They said, the heck with it. I'm not going to create any repository. I'm not going to go to classes. I'm just going to do my quizzes, uh, do my tests, give my workshops in. I, I am expert in C++. I just want to get the mark. They don't come to class. I respect that. Okay? But you cannot come two days before the final project tell me, I have a problem. I didn't create the repository. I didn't do workshop zero. Please help me. I'm not going to help you. Okay? So at least create your repository. And something important, uh, I'm going to explain after I answer my friend over here. Go ahead. Does it make any difference? No, no. GitHub account, you create. So, thank you. Okay? It's, it mentions in those videos. But when you create your GitHub account, I strongly suggest to, you, you can have many emails in your GitHub account. Add your Seneca email, and for now, while you're a student, make it a primary email. You can always change it later on when you graduate. The reason is that GitHub sends you announcements. Like, for example, you can watch my workshop repository, and as soon as something is changed in workshop, GitHub sends you a message that says, this page was updated. Then you go, you check to see what was new, a new workshop came up. So it essentially automatically announces you of changes and things that happen in the repository. It's a good idea to have your Seneca email in there so you get emails from uh, GitHub for announcements. OK? Uh, anything else before um, I start the first thing? All right. So 
What I'm going to do over here will be this. So, <clears throat> give me a second, please. Familiarize yourself with big blue button. It's not that I'm asking you to go get a big blue button. Big blue button is an online thing, actually, partially. Uh, our students at Seneca, actually, with Seneca code is in it. Big blue button is an online thing that we have. If something happens, I get sick, usually I don't cancel classes. I simply go online. So click over, um, uh, go big blue button demo on, uh, on internet. And it's going to bring up a demo so you can actually log into it and see how it works. Okay? So, I'm got, so you're going to launch over here, and I'm launching because I've never done it over here. I'm going to say OOP 244 uh, ZAA online lectures. Okay? And in here, I'm going to write whatever, yada, yada. Okay? Something like that. Um, I'm going to say students must wait. Session in this room may be recorded. And I'm going to click on Save. Now I can actually start the session, join the session. As soon as I do that, you can do the same thing from your computers. So if you log into Seneca right now, and you actually go to this session, you will see that a session has started, and you can actually join. And this becomes our platform. And right over here, I'm going to teach you. There are certain things that I ask you to do. Never, ever come in as listen only. I hate that. If you want to come and listen only, just don't. Later on, watch the recording. Okay? Always join in with microphone. Have a microphone so you can talk. When I'm online, I have much more control on my students because I keep polling the students. I'm going to say, okay, do you understand? And I look at all the replies. And if somebody doesn't reply, I know they're not listening. Okay? In here, I have to rely on my experience and look at the faces and know that the lady over there is, for example, working on his cell phone and, and it's not, she's not listening to me. Okay? So, so that's, those are the things. We don't have that one in online thing. So you need to have to log in with microphone and then immediately mute yourself. Okay? And whenever I ask you a question, you turn it on and you talk to me. Okay? So it's a very good idea. Uh, this is a very good tool. We use this to teach. Through, through COVID, and perfectly, there be no problem. So I'll use it, and I see over here, uh, Madeline and Sang Yu are, are, are joined. So, <laughs> so yeah, so um, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to join with anything because it's going to go crazy with audio, but that's what's going to happen. You're going to see stuff coming up. I'll share my screen, and, and it's going to be recorded too. And the recordings for the, uh, so I'm going to end the meeting. And the recordings for this thing will actually appear here. So the next time when you launch, you will see that all the recordings are listed over here. Also, I'll put it on YouTube. So that's for emergency cases that I forgot to mention, so I'm mentioning it now. So uh, how do we uh, work with Git? When you follow the instructions that I told you on Workshop Zero, what I'm doing now, you'll be able to do it. Okay, so uh, I have already created the repository, so I'm not going to do it now. You can go through the uh, workshop zero and see it, but we have a repository in uh, OP244 Seneca over here, and because I'm not signed in, I have to actually sign in over here to, uh, to be able to see those things, because uh, you, those are who are public, you can access. Those who are not, you cannot commit to it. For you, it's all yours. So you can actually commit to it. So remember, pull is download. Push is upload. Pull download, push upload. Add Big Brother's watching, which means add, it means you're telling to GitHub, watch over this file. I want you to track it. If you don't add it, it's not going to be watched. Add. Commit, it means this point of time is important to me, and I want to come back to it. Okay, so these are the four things that you need to remember. Of course, we have a clone thingy that happens only once. So in IPC, you kept downloading the zip and unzipped, right? Download zip. You don't do that. You clone once, you keep pulling, and it updates your repository with what you have. So for example, if I want the workshops over here, if I want to see all the notes that I had in past, I don't know how many years, 
everything, recordings, all my lectures are there. If you want to have access to that, to see samples and stuff like that, all you need to do is to go to Notes Archive and click on Code. Because you followed all my uh, uh, um, videos and did the installation, you click on SSH, you copy, and then you clone. How do you clone? If you install Tortoise Git, that is for Windows, sorry Mac users, then uh, you can do something like this. Where do I put it in here? So, uh, do we have a temp in here? So you go in here and you right click and you say git clone. This is Tortoise Git. Tortoise Git is an application that does GIF, GIF, git commands for you using the mouse. So you don't have to type it. If I wanted to do this, I had to go to the command line, type git clone and paste the URL I just copied. In here, I just say git clone and it automatically pastes what I copied for archive and I click on OK. It negotiates the SSH key between the two, so no user ID and password. And poof, you have an exact copy of what I have on Git with all the good stuff that are in there. Everything. Okay? Everything. And that's what happens with the notes. So when I actually tell you something is added, this is what you do. You come to the, uh, to, the, to the section, and sadly, I'm the only person who does this. So you come to OP244, NAA, and ZAA notes. Those are my sections. You click on Code, SSH, Copy. And then what you do in here, you go to the directory in which you want to put your stuff in. Now in here, I'm just going to temporarily create 2231, so I know that's the one. And you clone it. So everything I post over there comes over here. After you clone, you don't clone anymore. All you do is pull. And as soon as you pull, all the new stuff will be added. And you can exactly see what was changed. Let me demonstrate. So in class, I want to teach. So we are in class ZAA. I'm going to create a directory over here called ZAA. Okay? Then I'm going to start Visual Studio. Wait three years for it to start. No, 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 no. Oh, there you go. Create a new project. And this I'll do a few times, and then I'm not going to do it anymore. So for a few times that I come to class, I'm going to create the project so you see how it's created. Forget about what you have done in IPC. Please follow these. To start something new, either you have already the files that you can click and open, or if you don't, you create a new project. You select Empty Project C++ Windows Console. If you have followed this, the, the steps properly, you will have all these things. And then click on Next. You always check this, place solution and project in the same directory. Why? Because you are not creating Chrome the browser. You are not creating some point of sale application. You are writing a loop to print five things 30 times. For that, you don't need to have 50 projects in a solution. So your project and solution are the same in the same directory. Please. Then, be organized. Do all your schoolwork in the directory of your repository and nowhere else. I hate it when students call me, I have a problem. This is my path. Let me copy the code that I have written into the repository. Why? Do it in your repository for two reasons. Number one, you learn how to work with Git, which means the chances of getting hired in some company will go 40% higher. As soon as they Google your name and your Git account comes up, that's like a green light. Hire this person. Okay? Number two, I can see as a prof that you are working. If I see regularly your workshops are being added, I see your struggles over there. Tomorrow when you say, Farhad, I need 2% to make my PP plus A, I'll gladly give it to you because I see you are working on your stuff. But if I see you're not an active person, then why should I do that? Okay? Be a student to do things properly. So, be organized. Now, in here, I'm going to select the directory. 
which is NAA over there. This is how I name the things. This is 01. This is the first session that we have, and it's January 9th. So that's the name of my project, so you can follow it properly. This is the first session we had on January 9th. Then I'm going to create, create, create. Three years later, it's going to create the uh, solution for me, and I'm ready to go. OK? Now in here, in the solution, we have series of things that look like folders. These folders don't exist on your hard drive. These are filters that Visual Studio creates to organize the files. In your computer, everything is in the same directory. Now in here, I'm going to right click and say add new item. And the item I'm adding is a C++ file. Usually I call it prg.cpp, if I can type it, prg.cpp. OK? Now in here, I'm going to say include. IO stream no.h in C++. No.h in C++. Why? Because the sky is high at the moment. Okay. No reason for it, just know it. Then you have to say using namespace std. And if you can read that thing, you're a magician. Because I can't read it. Let me just make it a little bigger. Okay. That is badly out of focus. Let me see if it's going to be any better if I... Oh my God. I hope you don't get motion sickness. <laughs> okay, I, okay, so using namespace, yada, yada, yada. Then I'm going to say int main. In here, I'm going to say return zero. This is how you start everything. Create an empty canvas to work in. Don't start from the top and come to bottom. Always create your functions and code and loops and scopes. Complete, then fill in the blanks. Like this, the mistake that you're making becomes less and less. Now in here, so I'm going to say, welcome to OP24444. Remember I told you you got to get bored and said, come on, type properly? That's what I want to say. OK, ZAA, and I'm going to say, go to new line. OK? Insert this. Insert this C string into console out and end it with a new line. So first insert this into the console out, then insert this into the console out. Compile and run, control F5. Three years later, it compiles, runs, and as a result, you will see, welcome to OP, za. <laughs> OK, are we OK with this? All right. So. And now I want, to, I want you to have this code. So what do I do? I minimize this, go to the repository. To make the Big Brother watch, I add. Right click, tortoise git, add. So it says, what do you want to add? Does it add all the garbage in there? You see, it's adding everything. Why? Because my dot git ignore is not set properly. Let me take a look at it. Yes, this git ignore is not good. Go to my repository, the one that I have uh, created for the notes, for, uh, um, for whatever, whatever I have, like this one, the note is, it sucks, it doesn't work. Let me go from the previous... Uh, uh, semesters and pick that one up. So this git door is okay. I'm going to say copy and I'm going to come back to where I was and I'm going to paste it in here. Now see what happens? I'm going to replace. You see the icon became red. That means it's updated. I want to know what changed. I right click and I'll go tortoise git diff. These were added here that wasn't before. Git does that for you. So you can see exactly what changed to what. So now I know these are the stuff that I added specifically so garbage doesn't go on GitHub. You only need few files from your 
Visual Studio project to carry it around. You don't have to take the whole garbage with you. That's why in here I'm saying what to ignore. So now if I close this one and try one more time to add it, you will see that only four or five files are added, not the whole garbage that it needs. And I'm going to click on OK. Now it says, I added. You want to commit it? I will say yes. Commit means commit it to my computer. This is a good time I want to come back to to see what I've done. So I'm going to commit over here. And I'm going to give it a label. Hello, ZAA in it. It means the first one. And in here, I'm going to say commit. As soon as you commit, it says, you want to push it upstream to GitHub? I'm going to say yes. If I leave it over here, it's here. doesn't matter. You don't need to keep pushing it to GitHub. Keep committing to your own computer to have timestamps on the things that you have done. You want to go have lunch? Commit. Going to eat lunch. Go. Come back. Whatever you do. Going to washroom. Go. <laughs> okay? Submitting workshop one. Commit. So all the things that you do, you commit. When you push, all those commits are going to go to GitHub. So when I push over here, now it's in GitHub. If you actually go to GitHub and refresh the screen, you will see ZAA is there. And this is what I have written over there. Ta-da. So anything I do in class immediately is on GitHub. Refer to it, play with it. So I don't know what all the open computers are here in class. OK? You don't need them. OK? So I see your computer closed. I'm a happy guy. OK? It's proven. Taking notes on a computer does beep to learn. Nothing. It's not going to teach you anything. If you have a piece of paper taking a note, that's a different story. Because you get my information, you turn it to an analog thing and you start writing. That makes your program, your brain to do a process. Therefore, you remember things. This won't do anything. For those who are listening at home, I'm actually waving my windows, my, my, my fingers over an uh, imaginary keyboard. Typing on a keyboard won't, do, won't help anything. And for practice, we have the lab. So it would be nice if... You either bring notes or don't use notebooks in my class unless you need it. And if I see, if I see somebody's on their computer and they go, <laughs> everybody lose their notebooks. I catch one person smiling at their screen, everybody will lose their notebooks in class. And I'm going to tell who it was so you can go beat him up after the class. <laughs> no, I'm joking. I'm not going to do that. But if that case that happens, I'm not going to. I don't want it, OK? Because that's a distraction. I know everybody likes to think that that's not a distraction. It is a distraction. Are we OK down to this point? All right. Now, I'm back over here. So now you can actually pull this and see all these good stuff. Now I'm going to come back over here. I'm going to change a few stuff. So I'm going to say, and GitHub. So I just added something in here, right? And I'm going to say over here, I'm going to save this. As soon as I save this, I come down, you'll see that ZAA is changed over there. I don't need to add anything because the file was already added. And if you look at it, this is the file that is changed. I simply go over here, commit, added, and GitHub. Of course, you don't commit like this. This is just for testing. And I'm going to click on commit. And I'm going to push. Now it's up to the repository. If you have cloned the first time, you didn't need to clone again. All you need to do, all you needed to do, is to go to your repository, right click, and say pull. And it would bring only those parts. And the good thing is that as soon as it did that, let me refresh. Now you will see it says add GitHub. You see that? If I click over here, this is what I see. 
Look at this, and look at this. Are we good? So it actually shows you what was changed. And that's a beautiful thing about Git. Okay? That is how I help you. You give me your code, I'll fix it, you diff it, you see what I did to fix your code. Okay? And I think I know how to fix the focus over here. Let me see. Why? Because this is perfectly focused. Anyways. <laughs> Anyways. I don't think I helped it. But, you know, I tried. So are we good with this? Yes. Uh, as you added just five, uh, second. Pardon me? As you have added the second time. Yes. Uh, while you When one person asks a question, everybody zips. Okay? Sorry, I'm very serious about these things. My apologies. Go ahead, one more time. Who was the question? Oh! No, no. No. Yeah. Okay, go ahead. As you have added the second, mm -hmm. was. Uh huh. Yeah, they're all the same file. It, Git knows what is changed. You don't have two files over there. You'll find out. Okay, I cannot tell you which because I don't memorize these things. I look at it, I say, okay, this one is more than that, so this is, <laughs> I don't know. It shows, it, it has dates, it has versions and everything, okay? And you can do all these things on Tortoise Git too. So if I actually come over here on Tortoise Git, you can just right click over here and go Tortoise Git log. You see that? Where is log? Anyway, see you? Show log. You see that? Log shows this is, you see this? Add it, GitHub. Add it, and it shows what is modified. So if I click over here it, and open this one, now this is going to show what happened. And the pluses over here indicate, and the pluses over here indicate that these are the five things that are added. Minus, it means it's removed. Remove this line, add these two lines, that's the change. Are we good? Now, for Mac users, I don't know. Okay, for Mac users, you have to check, you have to go on the web page on Git web to see what the diff is. There is a diff command, but what it shows is not as easy. There is a diff command in, uh, in, um, with Git that you can actually see what was, what is changed. Um, I don't know how it works. I've, I haven't done it on, on, on Mac. I don't know how it works. Uh, yes? Yeah, it's always like that. You never, ever create a copy of something. Okay, now, everything is fixable with Git, but sometimes it becomes too complicated, which means this is what happens. You, at school, at school, you pull the repository, or clone the repository on one of the lab computers, you do your work, you push it up to your repository. Okay? So you changed it, correct? You come to your home, on your computer, you'll forget to pull. Because they always say, before you start working with anything, first pull. Make sure what you're working on is the latest, uh, latest version. You go home, you forgot that you have done something at school, you start modifying. When you push, you have conflict because you have changes that was not applied in here. Then it says it's conflict. It shows you the diff. It tells you to fix it. You're going to have to pull this, that, this, and that. That causes trouble. If that is the case, if that is the case, sometimes it's better just to uh, copy your code somewhere else, reclone it, and bring the changes back manually because you are not that professional. Read the Git book, then you know exactly what to do. But if, in here, I'm not, I'm not here to teach you how to work with Git. I'm teaching OP. Okay? So, and if conflicts like that happen, contact me. I'll fix it for you. But um, if you just remember, this should be a ritual for you. At any moment of time, you want to start working on something, you, that's why I say do everything in one repository. Don't create five different directories. Create one repository, be organized in there, put your stuff properly in there. At any moment you want to start the work, first you pull, and then you start working. 
nothing's going to go wrong. Because you're just one person and I'm one, like two people are working, conflicts never happen. So that's what you do. Always pull before you start and then do your work. And do it because sometimes I see there is something wrong in there. I put a message for you. I'll just go when I have nothing to do, nothing better to do. I'll go to student repositories and see what they are doing. And I see you did something wrong. I add a comment. Always pull before you commit. Okay? Always pull before you modify. Uh, I'll try not to do that. I'll let you know that's something I'm going to do. But uh, yeah. anyways. So that's that. That's how we're going to teach. Any questions? So again, as you see, it's live. I, I type in class. Uh, sometimes when the code is too big, I'm just going to bring pieces of code, and I complete it for you. And I'll try to keep, as I'll do my base to keep the same train of thought as we are going through. So build something, and then modify it in the next class, and modify it next class. But if I can't, then I'm going to build something new. But you will see that all these things are going to make sense, hopefully, at the end of the semester. Um, any questions? Suggestions? Objections? OK, this happens like 50,000 times if we do something in, in, online, OK? So online, every three minutes, I say, you understood you? Any questions? And I ping, pull. And something, you have to say yes or no, right? And that, that, that's how I know if you're not, in, uh, you're not listening or not. Because you go and you're, and anyways, you'll see. Uh, I hope that uh, we don't have any online class. I hope that I don't have to do it. but. Uh, uh, I don't like to cancel classes. So even, the, I think we have a Monday or something that, that uh, uh, the class, uh, there's a holiday. Okay? Um, if everybody's okay with that, I don't mind taking the class on that day too. Don't cancel the class and do it online. We'll see what happens. Let the time come and see what do we have. All right. Shall we start OOP? All right. I don't know if I missed something or not. I don't rehearse after the class. Uh, what happens is that uh, I think class is a very dynamic thing, and I'll try to uh, teach by getting feedback from students. So we are teaching object orientation using C++. Uh, when you wrote programs in C language, you had a main function. And everything begins at main, right? And main calls a function, that that calls a function, and that calls another function, and functions call functions, and therefore things happen. So all you do is to think how things are happening and try to simulate the actions that happens in your business logic. What is a business logic when I say Ah, by the way, I do that. If you don't want to answer, you simply say pass. Then I'll go to next victim. And I keep doing that, and I go through everyone. So uh, you, do you know what I mean when I say business logic? When learning? What do you mean by learning? I don't know what is an APS. <laughs> With learning that... Business logic. When I say business logic, what is it? Yes, what the client wants. Business logic means what the client wants. Well, Whose client? The person who asked you to write a program. Or your system analyst or whatever. That's business logic. Like apply 13% tax. That's business logic. List all the students with their average marks. That's business logic. Got it? So you essentially follow how business logic works, and you put it in routine, and your program kind of does what you want to do, and applies the business logic, and you work. Things become really pretty messy that way, especially when you have a kind of like, look at that thing. How can I write Windows doing that? How do you know what's going to happen first or next? Any application. Anything, if you want to just picture the things you need to do go to go to grocery store and buy cheese and come back and try to put those things in order, your head's going to explode. It's a difficult thing to do. Simulating real life, actions of real life 
into computer programming is a very tough thing. And it cannot be done that easily. I just looked at, not that I want to go somewhere, I want to see how much time I have to, to babble. So uh, 220 ends or 215 ends? 220 ends. Yeah. Okay. okay, so I have 15 minutes to fry your brains. Okay, so. So what they said is that our brain gets confused pretty easily. Seriously. You know what I mean? Just, it, you, can, you, can, you forget what you wanted to do. And you do something and you forget what you have done. And then you come back to your uh, uh, code and you, like a week after you have written the code, you go, which idiot wrote this? And that idiot was you. Okay? So it's, it's very difficult to do something like that. That's, I am, I am doing that every single day. Like, when I want to add a feature to that submitter thingy, that's my feeling every single time, okay? So, what they have done was this. They said, to make Ooh. our brain easily, try to, try to, try to make, trying to make your brain to make sense of things easier, we need to be able to simulate what we have in real world in our uh, computer. I don't know if I said that right or not because I just saw somebody smile at the screen. Okay, reset back. So again, for your brain to work properly, to be able to organize things, we try to simulate the real world into our program. For that, we need to check different objects. Every object that we want to work with, we have to uh, think about it and try to make that in our program. What is this? What does it do? What's the color? There you go. The name of my class is a marker. It's writes and it's black. Do I need to care who created it. No. All I want for it to write. Do I care if what is the color? Yes. I don't want to write with a yellow on a, on a uh, white whiteboard, right? So that's what you do. And what you do in your C++ program, you create what we call a class called marker. And that marker has a specification called color and probably the width of the head, how thick it's right, anything that is important for you, anything that is required by business logic, anything that your business logic requires for a marker. If this marker is supposed to be sold, then its price is important for us. If this marker is supposed to be taught by, by a teacher, I don't care what it costs, college puts it over there. You follow what I'm saying? And then you put all its properties and its specifications in there we call attributes. Then you add to this marker what it's supposed to do. That's the major difference between C and C++. In C language, you create a structure called marker. Then you have a function out there that says write marker. Then you pass the structure marker to the function so the function can write with your marker. That is unnatural. Why? Let's say it's 3 o'clock in the morning. I always give this example. It's dark, you're asleep. And then you hear, hello. You open your eyes. You look around, you hear again, hello. You turn on the light, you see no one. You hear again, hello. What are you going to do? I would pee in my pants, I don't know. <clears throat> Sleep again. So <clears throat> what just happened? I had a function without an owner. A hello function was called and said hello, but it didn't have an owner. In C++, we put the hello to your little sister who cannot sleep at night and comes over there and says, hello, can I sleep with you? I'm scared. Now, there is nothing scary about it. 
because hello came out of a person. So I don't pass the marker to a function. I put the function inside my marker, and I say, marker, write. And my marker writes. And I will never forget that. Why? Because in real life, a market writes. A market writes. That is object orientation in a nutshell. Now, to do this, we need to follow specific types of, his, of, of rules and regulations. Because again, our brains don't work properly. We need to put rules and follow the rules to be able to do something properly. Numero uno, number one. We need to package all the information that we have inside the class together. So a class that we have, which in C language you call it structure, needs to have variables in it, which in C in object orientation we call attributes, properties, member variables. And then you need to put actions that this thing can do in it. So the actions, so the functions go inside the structure too. You couldn't do that in C. In C++, you bring the functions inside the structure. The structure does the stuff for you. So what happens over here is that this action, putting the data, the attributes, and the functions, the behavior, together, we call it encapsulation. We encapsulate actions and the data of an object into an entity. That is rule number one, encapsulation. That encapsulation has lots of good side effects that we'll come to later. Number two, We reuse design. If I have a bicycle and I want to create a motorcycle, what do I do? Go on a board and start from scratch? No, you get a bicycle, stick an engine, you have a motorcycle. Right? It's an ugly thing. I know. <laughs> it's not a Harley Davidson, but it's a, it's a motorcycle, right? That's how object orientation works. You get an already designed thing. You say, inherit all the specification of that old thing and add these features. I have a bicycle, I inherit it into a motorcycle, and I only add what a motorcycle needs to make a bicycle a motorcycle. Therefore, as English idiom, I do not reinvent the wheel. I reuse design. This is called inheritance. Rule number two, your program should apply inheritance when you need to redo, redesign an object similar to another that is categorized in the same way. Are we good? That's number two. Number three. Based on what your object is, you may do certain actions in different ways. A pigeon flies. An airplane flies. They are both flying objects, right? A helicopter flies. A fly, mosquito, flies. Each one does the action of flying in a different way. So the action flying does the floating in the air where it's supposed to do. In a jet engine, it pushes through a turbine, does something. In a propeller airplane, does something else. In a drone that everybody flies these days, and a pigeon does it, and a kite does it in a different way. Actually, kite glides, glides it doesn't fly. So, but, but anyways, so the action of flying can be done in different ways. When same action in the hierarchy of inheritance is done in different ways, same action 
done in different ways. This is called a polymorphic. Poly means many, morph means shapes. An action can have many different shapes. So this is the third thing that your application should do. You do these three things, ta-da! You have an object-oriented application. And we'll teach you what I told you in this 13 minutes is what we're going to learn in this 13 weeks. OK? One by one to see exactly how it's going to happen. The concept is simple. We want to simulate the real world in our application. How it's done, that's a different story. Are we OK one? Are we OK two? So, OK. Any questions? Suggestions? Objections? You're all good? Thank you. Have a beautiful day.